תודה רבה. בוקר טוב, ילדים וילדות. Okay, I want to give myself simultaneously in Hebrew while I'm talking to you in English, just for fun. I'm going to have a little timer here, so I'll go over. So if I press the button here, it's not so I'm checking my email, I promise. It's a great honor for me to be here today, and a great pleasure to be in, uh, in this uh, wonderful uh, organization, in this wonderful country, a uh, place I have not been in 35 years. And um, I want to thank... Um, the organizers, especially um, Mina and, uh, and uh, Tali and their husbands, uh, who, as we know, are only second in command. Um, the wife is always in charge. And uh, but I thank Amit and Yale, and Yale as well. And I'll talk to you briefly about respiratory matters in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, I think of this disease as a respiratory disease. The, uh, I know that this is a muscular disease, uh, but to me, Duchenne is a respiratory disease because so much of, of the problems we see are respiratory. All are preventable. 100% of the respiratory complications are preventable and can be anticipated and can be, um, with good uh, therapies, can be uh, avoided. Uh, and I would say the cost of prevention is a tiny fraction of the cost of complications. And so these devices we'll talk about today pay for themselves many times over. The idea of therapeutic nihilism, which means that the physicians believe that the children's lives don't matter um, and that the children should just go be allowed to die, that day is gone. And I'm here to say that your children's lives matter greatly and these are important people and that they have things to do and to contribute. And um, parents have really changed the landscape and change how we view this disease. And it's really through parental activism that I, I've changed my career and, and why I'm here today. This is Duchenne himself. And we know that Duchenne is common. And it used to be that the cause of the death was 80% of the time of respiratory. It's really not so much true anymore, at least in America, because we now can prevent all respiratory um, problems. Um, it used to be that people with Duchenne would die in their late teens and early 20s. Um, that is no longer the case. Um, <laughs> But what we found in America is that survival would greatly vary by location. If you lived in the American Northeast, you would live by statistics six months longer than you would live if you lived in the American South. And this is not because of genetics. This is because of um, differences in care. And I began to work with Pat Furlong and say, we are having a big problem, which is that there are no declared standards of care in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy and especially for restaurant management. And the health insurance companies would say no to me when I would make requests. And they would say there's no evidence base. That term means there's no good scientific basis for the therapies we're recommending. And the problem was that um, they, would, they would say no to me and I could not get a device like the cough assist device approved. And then my patient would develop pneumonia and be hospitalized. And that made me very angry. And um, rather than just being angry, I took the, uh, you might say, the Israeli approach to it, which is to, um, is to uh, not just be angry, but to take action and to make a difference. And so um, I, um, with um, Pat's help, I formed a committee to say we will force the insurance companies to no longer say no, to say yes, to approve these therapies by um, publishing a, a consensus statement, which we did in 2004. Um, and I think we've been able to really improve things, which is uh, uh, I take great pride in. Um, the issues really uh, that we deal with across all international borders, a lot of data, and in general, um, people who have Duchenne have a good quality of life. This young man we just saw in the movie, Alone, he clearly is happy in his life. He clearly is enjoying his life, and um, that's a life that's worth supporting. Um, the only uh, uh, deficiency that would consistently reported is that young men uh, are unhappy in their love lives, and that's something that um, I think one day we'll get better at. But from the wrestler standpoint, there really are um, four stages. The, the first stage is when you are in ambulatory. If you, if you can walk, you don't need uh, much or any help with respiratory matters. Uh, and then in that stage, 
The most important thing is, is making sure the kids get their influenza vaccinations every year. And then I like to get to know the families. It's more important for them to know who their resources are and uh, then that there's any specific therapies I, I give. I meet them once a year. I have them come into my office and do lung function testing. And um, it's, I just like just to reassure them the kids look great. And just to know, so they know who I am. So that they know who I am, they know how to reach me before there's a problem. Because I can always anticipate when there's a problem. The stage in which you lose the ability to cough occurs after you're in a wheelchair full time. And that's usually in the, in the mid-teens. Um, the third stage is when you don't have enough um, strength to breathe when you're asleep, but you breathe okay when you're awake. And the last stage is when you don't have the ability to breathe sufficiently awake or asleep. For every stage, there are non-invasive interventions that can be life-saving. Um, so we talked about the stage one. I know there's a lot of families of young children here. I will tell you that um, I don't recommend anything specific. I don't think that you need to train the, the breathing muscles, that they, they do just fine. Um, I think that in general, fitness is really important and activity is important. I'm a big believer in, in uh, physical therapy and, in, and uh, physical activity. Um, I don't say there's any specific, I don't prescribe any specific instructions for the parents, um, aside from making sure the kids are active and, and participating in life. Um, I do strongly recommend the influence of vaccination and also the um, vaccination called pneumovax. Um, during the stage in which there's trouble with coughing, um, this concept is referred to as airway clearance. And airway clearance is not one thing, it's two linked processes. And there is what's called mucociliary clearance. That refers to how the lungs are swept clean by cells that, that have cilia on them. The cilia sweep the lungs. And they sweep the mucus into the central portion of the lungs here. And then when your body senses some mucus uh, there, that triggers a cough and you cough it out. So you need to have both mucociliary clearance and cough clearance. And mucociliary clearance is impaired in a disease called cystic fibrosis, which is also common. Uh, and um, it's also, also impaired in children smokers. So by the way, if you smoke, don't smoke inside your home. Take it outside. Um, because that will impair mucociliary clearance for your son. Um, cough clearance is the issue in these patients because they, once they lose the ability to cough, they're at high risk for pneumonia. It's easy to predict who cannot cough. I can measure what's called peak cough flow. It's a very simple measurement done um, in, the, in my office. And if your cough flow is less than 270, then that allows you to get a cough assist device. And um, the cough assist device is a very interesting story. Um, before we had the mechanical device, we, we, we've always had the ability to help coughing with, with your hands, and that's called manually assisted coughing. And it's essentially like a Heimlich maneuver where you basically are giving a, uh, an abdominal thrust like so, or a thoracic squeeze. It's a hug at the bottom of the rib cage. And um, it's helpful to have an ambu bag for this so you can inflate the lungs fully and then have the person cough out. I will tell you though, in, in the best of circumstances, it's not nearly as effective as the mechanical version. Um, I think it's a really important point that there's a muscle that's hard to stretch. You know, we talk about stretching, and Pat had a great talk about this. Stretching is really important. You stretch your long, you know, your, your long muscles like your biceps, and, and you want to get stretching for all your joints. But the one muscle that the old, you cannot stretch passively is the muscles between your ribs. These are called the intercostal muscles. And the only way to stretch them, and I'm going to ask you all to do this with me right now, is take a deep breath. Do you feel your muscles stretching in here? That's how you stretch your intercostal muscles. What can happen with Duchenne is that those muscles, once you lose your ability to take a deep breath, they don't get stretched and they can become rigid. And so the chest wall becomes very stiff in the later stages of Duchenne. And I strongly believe that stretching the intercostal muscles is a very important part of physical therapy of the chest. And that can be done um, with an ambu bag, I think you can encourage your kids to take a deep breath when they're younger, but when they get into chairs, an ambu bag is useful, but ultimately a cough assist device will be useful. And, and I'm happy to say we have a cough assist device here in the room. I'll be happy to show it to you. And we have a, folk, a person from the company that sells the cough assist device. This, by the way, is the veterinary version of um, airway clearance. So 
It was around 1994 that the um, mechanical cough machine came out, um, the current model. But there's an, an interesting uh, historic history to this. It was actually invented in 1952. And if you throw your minds back to the, to the 1940s and 50s, um, you, you will remember that there was a big epidemic of a, of, of a single viral disease that caused people to, to suddenly lose the ability to breathe and cough. And what was that, anybody? Polio, right. So polio, there was this huge epidemic of, of, of polio. And so suddenly we had all these people that could not breathe. And they would go into iron lungs. And the problem is that we could save their life by breathing for them with an iron lung, like with a, a negative pressure ventilator. But these people would then die of pneumonia. And this guy, Alvin Barak in 1952, a member of my tribe here, um, a Jewish name, um, invented the first cough machine. And here he is in 1952 at, with a patient on an iron lung. And what he would do is he would, he would put positive pressure into the chamber and cause the person's lungs to suddenly deflate. And he said, well, if I can do that with a negative pressure, why can't I do that with a inflating and deflating the lung with, with a mouthpiece? And he actually did this. He proved that it worked by using dogs. So this is the only study ever that proved that this thing worked it was in 1952 in dogs. And everything else has been done using just flows, but this, this is the only data, these are the only data, dog bronchography. And we hope to repeat these data in humans um, using a different form of, um, of uh, measurement. So that's a plan that I have work, uh, work working out with the company that makes this device. This is the very first device, it was called a coffelator, and it came out in the 50s. And there's a story about how, these, how this came out. So when polio went away, the big need for these machines went away and the company stopped making them. And so there was a guy, there is a man, is a good friend of mine named John Bach. And Dr. Bach was using these devices in a rehab hospital and he couldn't get parts for them anymore. And so here it is, it's, it's 1990, these things have, are, are 20 and 25 years old and he's using them every day and he can't get parts. And so he goes around to all these companies and saying, you know, there's this great need for a machine to cough for my patients. And it's already FDA approved. Um, it's called a cough layer. Will you make this machine? And all these companies went around saying, no, no there's no mark for that. So, well, there's all these Duchenne patients, and people with spinal cord injuries, and ALS patients, and on and on, so many causes of weakness. And these companies would say, no, 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 not, there's no, no market for that. We're not going to do that. We're not interested. And, and they went to a guy named John Bach. I'm sorry, to uh, John Emerson, Jack Emerson. And Jack was about 90 years old, and he had invented um, the positive pressure ventilator. He had reinvented the negative pressure ventilator of the iron lung. And he was this brilliant guy in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He'd never gone to college, and he, he was one of the best inventors of, in the history of respiratory medicine. And um, he, he, uh, he said, yeah, I could do that. I, I, you know, he, he remembered the polio years, because he was 90 years old. And he said, I could do that. And he, and he had this little company in, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts called Emerson, J.H. Emerson and Sons. And they began to make this device around 93, 94. And um, I began to prescribe that around 94 because you know, patients, uh, and again, we learned so much from our patients, right? And what I've learned has all, all been on the job. And we had a patient who said, I want this device for my son. And I said, you know, it seems very reasonable. And so we prescribed it and somehow, Miraculously, the insurance company approved it, and, we, and, I, and I watched it work, and I thought, oh my God, this thing really does work. And we began to use it more and more and fight harder to get it. And um, so for, then we worked on this uh, um, consensus statement, and, and their, the business really took off, I think, with the publication of the consensus guidelines. And um, Jack passed away, and his son George uh, took over the company. Joe's a wonderful guy. And uh, he told me one day he was selling his company, and I was upset because I like George and I like dealing with him. And he told me he was trying to get um, around $10 million for his company. And I thought, well, I wish I had something worth $10 million. And um, it turns out that he got $23 million for it uh, instead. And um, he gave $1 million away just to his, his employees as, as a gift, uh, as a uh, gratitude. And um, anyway, the, the story goes that um, um, John Bach uh, learned about this from me at a meeting that he, that he had single-handedly created a $23 million company from which he made not a single penny. But he can feel, he can sleep very well at night knowing that he has saved 
countless lives by bringing back this device. And I have been um, a very strong supporter of it. This is the Coffee device again, and, and it can be used, you can see, with a trach, it can be used with a mouthpiece, with a mask. Um, and the uh, original version was called the Inex of Labor. You can see there on the, on the screen, there's a, um, in the lower right corner. Um, it, but no one could pronounce that, so they changed it to Cough Assist. And there's a new version coming out um, at some point in the next few years. I've seen a, a, a prototype. It's going to be much smaller and lighter. But right now, this is the best we have. And um, I mean, uh, we, we have some specific numbers, but I always tell the physicians I work with, your instincts are more important than the numbers. And if, you're, if you feel this kid needs the device, then you, you ask for it. If the parents report he's a lot of trouble clearing secretions, get it. Um, there's no single number that, that, that tells you what to do. You use your judgment. It's more important than, than, than a measurement. Um, so quite often people will have um, numbers that are around 270 and I'll say, this is a kid who's getting into trouble. If you've had pneumonia, you're going to get it from me. I would rather the families have it too early than too late. Excuse me, I'm checking my time here. So um, I'll tell you a, 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 a quick story before I show this video. Now, this is a challenge because I'm hoping this will, will, um, will work. Um, I was hit by a truck when I was cycling six years ago. I was very badly injured. And uh, I broke my femur in my neck. And after my second operation to have a spinal fusion, I woke up with the inability to cough. I, um, and I could not swallow either because, I had, uh, because of the operation and the surgical procedure on my neck. And I, and I thought, this is really interesting. I cannot swallow, so I'm aspirating my own saliva. I've become a chronic aspirator. I cannot cough. I have no airway clearance, and I have a lot of secretions right now from the anesthesia. I have become a Dr. Finder patient. And, I, uh, and he said, Dr. Finder, if you don't start clearing the airway, you're going to be intubated, and you're going to be moved to the intensive care unit. And I thought, that is going to be like going to an outer circle of hell. And so I, although I was heavily drugged from all the, um, you know, pain, I was in terrible pain. I thought, I know what I need. I need a caucuses device. And so I sort of croaked into the, into the phone. I, 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 said, I said, can be a respiratory therapist. And, the rest are, and, and so the nurse brought over a respiratory therapist. And I said, I need a cough assist to us. And the respiratory therapist said, Doc, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. We ain't got it. And I thought, well, I really am in hell. And then I called over to my hospital, the children's hospital in Pittsburgh, and said, help me. And my restaurant therapist came running over with the conferences device. Actually, we have one in the corner down there. And um, um, he hooked it up for me. And by God, this thing was unbelievable. And I've been, I had been prescribing this thing for 10 years, from 94 to 2004. Never did I ever imagine I'd be using it as a patient. And I could feel the secretions moving from, from here to here, from here to here. And, and then after, and then the fifth cycle, gulp out of my mouth. And I thought, oh. Thank God. It was such a blessed relief to have my airways cleared. I, I cannot even describe to you the relief it was. To, because it was such an uncomfortable feeling to have secretions gurgling around in my airways that I couldn't clear. I used it for about three days until the pain from my um, operation cleared and I could once again cough. And so I am probably the only person on the planet who can tell you this as a patient as well as a physician that this thing works. And I joke that respironics will not even let them buy me a cup of coffee. I do not have a conflict of interest. I do not invest in this company. Um, I speak to you from the heart, from Halev. And so, uh, so when I tell you this thing works, I, I want you to believe me it does. Um, this is a video of a patient of mine, Patrick. Went to, he's going to talk about it. My name is Patrick Daniels, and I work at Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney, which is a law firm in Pittsburgh. Well, mostly I do uh, research and writing in preparing for these various cases that we're involved in. I have a Duchenne form of muscular dystrophy. Uh, it is a degenerative muscular disease, and it was something that I, I was born with. Well, I've been using the coffices device for approximately seven years. Uh, before I used that device, 
Um, I got very sick um, and uh, I got pneumonia and I had to be hospitalized for two weeks. But since that time, when I started using the cough assist, I have not been hospitalized. Not once. Patrick has been a regular user of the cough assist device. And since he's been using it on a regular basis, never had pneumonia. And we're talking the better part of a decade. Because here's a guy that his parents were told he would, he would be lucky to graduate from high school. Graduate from high school, graduate from college, graduate from law school. Passes the bar on the first attempt. Works downtown. So that's a guy um, who I find very inspiring. And, uh, Patrick Daniels is his name. And um, I'm very um, sad to report to you that Patrick um, uh, did pass away from a sudden cardiac event. I never had a respiratory complication uh, since I began to manage him. And um, he is inspiring to me because he says, here's a guy who, um, using, you know, with the, the medicine of, of 30 plus years ago, with, and he wasn't on steroids until very late in his life. Um, he, he didn't have aggressive stretching. A, a lot of things that he could have benefited from, he didn't. Uh, and yet, he was a bright guy and incredibly um, dedicated. And you asked Patrick, what's the quality of his life? He had a good life. And I have to tell you that um, I'm just very, very uh, saddened and, and upset when he, when he had sudden cardiac event and died. But he died getting ready for work. He was being, he was, he was in his father's arms. His father was helping him shower to get ready for work. And his heart stopped. And he looked up and said, oh my God, and stopped. And um, so, he, I mean, not that I, I, you know, to be, to say, to die without pain in your home, uh, in the arms of uh, a person who loves you. It's about as good as you can make it. So I, I'm, I'm not happy he died, but I'm, I'm happy that he at least he had a, a, a peaceful, a good ending to his life. And, it, and his life continues to provide meaning to others around the world, and uh, I, I like uh, the show's video. Not as an advertisement for, um, for, for uh, you know, a company, but to say that, that you can have a life, even based on, without all the hope of the new technologies and of the new <coughs> therapies and antisense oligonucleotides and, and all the wonderful things that Dr. Wagner is talking about, just based on, on existing technolo technologies that's been around since 94, here's a guy that made a good life for himself. So I, have, I, I find a lot of hope from this guy. Um, now let me just um, switch back to my uh, uh, talk. Give me an eye on the time. In my remaining eight minutes. <laughs> um, where am I? Sorry, I'm going to have to just shift gears once again to the uh, talk. So Patrick, in addition to um, demonstrating that the coffee device was helpful, also demonstrated that you can live in complete respiratory failure. Remember, this guy has no ability to breathe um, um, sufficiently, although he does obviously talk and, and, and exist without a, a train. You notice he was using a mouthpiece ventilator. And so the, the, um, the new sort of standards of care, or the new approaches, has been non-invasive um, ventilation. And so when we have, um, when we have a person who doesn't breathe well in sleep, and I'm a big believer in getting sleep studies for these patients, and you can predict who needs them because generally the, the, the lung function, the forced vital capacity, will be in the 30 to 40 percent range or less. They need help with breathing in sleep. And we use a BiPAP, which is a, a machine to help them breathe, and they, they basically wear a mask. Um, and the key thing with the mask is the interface, that, that everyone's face is differently shaped you know, when you have a Jewish nose, you have to have a Jewish mask, I guess. And um, so they, uh, they have many different uh, interfaces, different nose types of uh, interfaces. The nasal mask, full face mask, you can even use a lip seal. This is called an Adams circuit. The key thing is to try something until something fits well, so there's no pressure points. And then and at night, they wear the mask, and during the day, when they later, in stage four, need help breathing during the day, we can use a mouthpiece ventilator. Now, I'm not saying I never, ever do a trach, um, but we, we usually start with non-invasive ventilation. And um, the interesting thing is that we started with the iron lung. We started with non-invasive ventilation in the 50s. And then we went to all invasive ventilation in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And now we're swinging back to non-invasive ventilation in the, in the 2000s. And I've been very successfully 
able to avoid trachs in most of my patients. And this is not work that I started. This has really um, been around since, since 1979. The first report was from this guy, Dr. Alexander. We we'll worked with Dr. Bach later on. Dr. Bach is the person who really described how to do this. And it works very well. And, and the key thing is just to have a, um, a gooseneck that you hook up. Um, and, you, and you put an angled mouthpiece attached to the ventilator, which is right here. And um, the key thing is that you can have a long, good life um, with non evasive uh, means of ventilation. This is the paper we published in 2004. Stress was on anticipation on non-invasive ventilation, on multi-specialty specialty care, and, um, that, and uh, here's the Italian version, Assistenza Respiratoria del Passione con Dystrophia Muscolare Duchenne. And, um, thank you. Uh, this is the parent project in Italy's translation. And I think that, and there have been subsequent very important papers that have, have been published um, that have um, uh, gone on to help further define the standards of care. This was, this was just respiratory. Uh, in 2010, we published uh, two papers in, in the Lancet, um, and uh, um, there have been another, a lot of, of, of guideline statements. So I think that the parents have really pushed the agenda, saying we want people to accept standards of care and really to say that these kids' lives really matter. And, and here's Kevin years later, years later, <coughs> and you can see he's much older now, and you can see he's he's, he's using his mouth, he's ventilator, and you can see there's dogs on his bed. Anyway, he's he's doing well. And what I want to leave you with is that for every stage of this disease, there are non-invasive treatments that can be anticipated, and that, that the quality of life is, is absolutely key. That we, no one wants to be kept at home. People want to be out, going to the movies, working, uh, going shopping, uh, enjoying life. Um, here's Patrick graduating from law school. Here's Patrick's web page. And I, I want to leave you. Um, to say, uh, today to say that the guys like Patrick continue to inspire me and I'm, I'm happy to come to Israel to, to, um, to help um, with, with, in any way I can, although I've got to tell you I was very impressed with all the physicians I've met at Aline, Meyer, and Shatter Children's. I think um, to some degree I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle, that you have great physicians here and um, I know that the, the government now accepts the conferences device. And so I'm very optimistic for, for, for what you guys can do here in Israel. I, um, although I'm honored to be here, you probably don't need me. And um, so I'll say with that, Toda Raza.